Hey guys. Hey. Hello, hello. It's been a while. Just realized that I was on mute. Hello everyone. This is the C5 versus D5 panel. My name is Franz Streiner. I'm the co-founder and uh, chairman of Techme Group, which includes companies like Blockchain Labs, Techme Capital, Brave New Coin, and a few others. Today we're going to be talking about centralized versus decentralized finance. I'm just going to quickly introduce everybody and paint some context to this panel, and then everybody can introduce themselves and their businesses further. So we have James Beatty, which is uh, CEO of TFOS, the Toronto Futures Options and Swaps Exchange. We have Baruf Rao, which is the CEO of Decentralized Exchange at Leverage.io. And we have Jonathan Dunsmore, a securities lawyer and uh, founder of Dunsmore Law. So to paint a little bit of context to uh, this panel today, I'd like to just take uh, the viewership through a very quick journey. So in the beginning, there was Bitcoin that represented the advent of digital value, right? Scarcity and a digital medium. There was a bunch of forks, Litecoin, Peercoin, so on and so forth. A few years passed, and eventually we got to Ethereum in about 2015. I was at the launch uh, conference in Toronto in 2015 for Ethereum, and we realized that you can now start to represent all sorts of assets in uh, the form of a token or on a blockchain. And of course, the advent of ERC-20, you know, very easy, low barrier to entry way to mint a token and uh, have it represent anything you'd like, increased the amount of things that were available within this digital medium. A few years re were required for the infrastructure to be built out. There was a uh, inflow of investments into various different interoperability, Oracle, middleware, and tooling. And that finally leads to the advent of uh, what we're now describing as DeFi, you know, with new killer applications like automated market makers, AMMs, the multi-billion dollar liquidity pool that is Uniswap and others. So uh, where is all this DeFi stuff going? And what's CeFi doing about it? We're gonna get right into it and uh, I'll just kick off with the first question. I'd like each of you to take uh, no more than three minutes uh, answering the following. If you could please give the audience a little bit of context about yourself, your career, your background, and answer how, why, and when you got into crypto. Perhaps we can start with James. Fran, thank you uh, for that. And uh, thank you to the uh, untraceable group for putting together this very professional conference uh, under such a, you know, an interesting time in which we live. Uh, when I look at uh, my background and evolution, you know, I've spent all of my career uh, in the traditional centralized finance uh, world, uh, working with uh, different broker dealers, uh, Canadian bank owned broker dealers here in Toronto. And uh, over the last few years, have run my own private practice and spent a lot of time with uh, companies that are going from private to public and how do they evolve? How do they build? How do they grow a strategy? How do you build a global strategy? So that is how I was introduced to, as I'll call it, digital assets um, as per se. And, you know, I, I look at centralized finance as a business that has evolved in its existing manner over literally hundreds of years for many reasons. And those reasons are still somewhat relevant to uh, the basics of, of the economy and supply and demand. And I think that the uh, centralized finance world learns a lot from decentralized finance. And the reality is that a lot of the activities, a lot of the behaviors, a lot of the processes, a lot of what you're doing is going to have a very big impact on how we in the regulated, transparent, traditional world, if we want to call it, um, we'll do it. Uh, TFOS is very much in the business of supporting digital assets. We are a new uh, derivatives exchange and clearinghouse subject to regulatory approval here in Canada through the CSA. We have applications bef before both uh, the OSC and the AMF for our exchange and our clearinghouse. And we intend to be at the forefront of a number of different asset classes. Um, and digital being one of them uh, because of the fact that you are revolutionizing uh, finance as we see and uh, our intention is to support that in a very uh, proactive manner. You know, I think earlier we were talking about uh, 
global realities. And, you know, Fran, you were talking about customer bases and, and how they're global. And that is very, very true for exchanges. And, you know, I hope that some of the thoughts that I bring to this conversation are about some of the traditional things that exist in centralized finance are there for good reason. And those who are in decentralized finance can learn from those things. So that is you, uh, James. my very long-winded introduction. <laughs> no, that's great. And look, uh, we'll move on to Jonathan next. Same question. Uh, please give us a bit of context into your career, uh, your business, and how, when, and why you got into crypto or digital assets. I was dragged kicking and screaming. Um, so I fell into this crazy weird world of blockchain and cryptocurrency in mid to late 2016, uh, where we're based in Buffalo, New York. So I had a bunch of Canadians and uh, Manhattanites coming up and asking about these things called ICOs. And uh, me as a corporate securities attorney was running and screaming and crying, saying these are illegal. You shouldn't do these. Um, and then I had a client who basically asked, you know, well, what would it look like on a blockchain? Uh, and then I kind of fell into, as James uh, was kind of hinting at, all the problems with uh, our current systems and how old and antiquated they are, especially in the capital markets who, you know, for the better part of uh, 30 years, hasn't really changed since the Bloomberg terminal. Um, and so that's kind of just spurred it from here. And I drank the Kool-Aid, fell down the rabbit hole, whatever uh, you know analogy you want to use. Uh, and we've uh, handled everything uh, around the world. Uh, anybody who you know comes to the U.S., whether it's a regulatory issue, whether they've been in trouble or they are in trouble or they may be getting in trouble, uh, we handle those kind of situations uh, with the SEC, the CFTC, FinCEN, uh, the whole alphabet soup of, of the United States, um, and state regulatory actions as well. There was a number of states that uh, became very gung-ho and wanted to make the names for themselves uh, in the ICO craze when there were illegal offerings. And so this firm has uh, tried to make the best of a bad situation in most cases where we've helped people who were not being fraudulent and not uh, uh, you know, necessarily comporting with the law, but uh, they wanted to. They wanted to try and they were at the bleeding edge and maybe they didn't realize they needed a securities attorney or a commodities attorney or a blockchain attorney or whatever you want to call it. Um, but that's how we've kind of evolved. Uh, this is still a securities practice. I still call myself a corporate securities lawyer. Uh, and then we help people who, uh, whether they want to be on chain or they are thinking about being on chain or dealing with anything on the pesky little blockchain, uh, whichever one it is, uh, we help them move forward and we help kind of move the regulators forward, which is, I promise you, a, a much harder job than uh, putting things on a blockchain. Mm -hmm. How do the words uh, inverse... Um credit default swaps uh, <laughs> make you feel. Wow. We'll get into that. Uh, we'll get into the fun <laughs> product stuff have. shortly. <laughs> exactly. This is going to be fun. So look, Barra Frau, founder of uh, Leverage Decentralized Exchange, you've got a very interesting history at Wall Street. Tell us about your history and how, when, and why you got into crypto. Right. So I've been uh, on Wall Street for 10 years, and uh, I was very comfortable there. Uh, you know, I believed in the system. I I saw uh, how regulation worked. I, I wrote software that uh, had to, um, you know, comply with all the regulations and so on. Uh, but the 2008 crash uh, sort of made, you know, it shook, my, shook me out of my uh, comfort zone. What I realized is that the way regulations are written and enforced and, and just, just the way that the, the the financial industry as an or organism uh, behaves is that it absorbs all the small um, uh, you know shocks and all of that comes together in one big shock every 10 years or so and the there, there is simply no escape from it and what you see is everything from uh, uh, you know every time they um, create a new regulation it eventually leads to a crisis which requires for, you know um, more regulation and so on so i sort of had a crisis of faith and uh, i left wall street to work purely on technology i moved to the west coast uh, and um, it was there there pretty much soon like the very next year uh, you know bitcoin was started i saw an article about bitcoin and uh, it was just you know they were it was just the first bitcoin obituary they said you know bitcoin is dead it has crashed like 
to two dollars or something like this and they had printed a chart of it and i was a trader and i saw the chart and i knew this was a, a once in a generation or once in a lifetime opportunity this is something just amazing i didn't know what it was but I, just from the chart because uh, traders most of them just they look at the chart and they know I, you know it's uh, uh, charts are like you know like like astrology for, <laughs> for traders so you know i, I saw and you know, that is, realization <laughs> in, into your your current company right right so then what i did was i realized that the uh, you have to build a trading system using this technology at that time that was on the bitcoin we built a derivatives exchange because we thought derivatives is the cleanest way to do it and we could try to do it non-custodial and we were actually the first non-custodial exchange ever this was in 2015 2016. this this was not even something this was even before ethereum existed uh, and then we we got something working semi non-custodial and then when ethereum was uh, mature enough we realized we could do it completely non-custodial and do it at high speed uh, so our our goal was to create an exchange that looks and feels and performs just like a centralized exchange, but it is non-custodial in the sense everyone has control over their own um, crypto. And uh, in the and when we said we were going to do it, people said this is impossible. This is impossible for all these mathematical reasons. And we we said no. We 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 think it's possible. And we did launch uh, in February of last year. It's been um, you know a little more than one and a half years. Um, so we recently launched um, a derivatives platform, and uh, we, you know, did, I, I believe that this is just getting started. Uh, there will be a lot of products. There will be a lot of decentralization. There will be layer to solutions, and so on. And we are uh, thick in the middle of it. We're at the cutting edge of it. Thank you, Barf. So the next question is about DeFi or regulation in general. Now, uh, I think this needs to be slightly different to each of you so that we can get the maximum for the audience from each of your respective uh, experiences. Um, so perhaps, Jonathan, you can uh, give us your perspective. Do we need more regulation, less regulation? How do you see both centralized and decentralized exchanges reacting to the regulatory landscape that it continues to be evolving? Oh, throw me under the bus first. Um, I, I mean, it's a double-edged sword, right, guys? Like we can all understand that uh, extremes are generally bad. Uh, whether it's fully decentralized to the point where nobody's in control and everything is operating on some code that may or may not uh, last generations, um, and then there's also what we're currently dealing with, which is a fairly uh, centralized system that uh, allows people to launder money money at just egregious amounts of uh, trillions and trillions of dollars every year. Um, and, and the Fed and the regulators really don't care. Um, the Panama Papers came out and I think even now, uh, only Germany is really going after anybody. So we can see that the system's broken. We just can't see uh, necessarily how to fix it unless we kind of all work together and, and like what some of these guys are doing from Wall Street and uh, you know, kind of poking at the bear and seeing where the soft points are. And I think those are the first steps. I think to answer your question is, does there need to be more regulation? Uh, it depends is the lawyer answer. Um, in certain ways, I think that, you know, we need to move fast and break things to steal Facebook's motto, which is a terrible idea. But uh, I think that's kind of necessary right now. I think that there's a lot of things in this world that unfortunately my government, even as strong and powerful as uh, we are, uh, or sometimes believe we are, we can't stop everything that is put out there. Uh, and to attempt to do so uh, is absolutely stupid. There's no real way to shut down some of this stuff. And so just like letting Pandora out of her box, uh, we've got to figure out how to work with it. And I think that especially when it comes to technology, it's better to bite the bullet and learn about it and try to figure out how to work with it than fight against it. Because being a Luddite, well, it makes you a Luddite. <laughs> You're not around for too long. Thank you. Well, James, what's um, your perspective? I know that you're currently really deep in the application process with your regulators. Uh, I believe there was actually a bit of a camaraderie between which of the regulators should be regulating you, right? Um, well, tell us about your experience and what you're going through on the regulatory front. So I'll, I'll give you a bit of our experience. Our applications for both the exchange and the clearinghouse were filed uh, basically one calendar year ago. And these are intensely large documents, intensely, intensely large 
activity, lawyers, et cetera, that go into these applications. And, and with them, there's a lot of resources required, workshops and updates to move them along. And so when I think of regulation, you know, the, the easy answer is always less, but let's be clear, regulation exists for a reason. We are in the investment business. There has been major fraud over the years historically, which is why regulation exists. So let's just put it on the table and everyone in this room is in the business of risk capital. And, you know, we have to normalize the conversation about risk because what our industries have done is we've treated risk as a word we can't say when we repackage and package things and say it's not risk. Well, put risk on the table, be transparent and label it what it is. So the regulatory environment is uh, one that is not going away. I suggest that the regulators need to very much understand what is coming out of decentralized finance and understand that a lot of the learnings from decentralized finance are for a reason. You know, whether it's Barath talking about, you know, uh, your own experiences with the regulatory world or not, these things have happened for a reason. This is like a, this is like a global democratization happening. And let's be clear, the regulators are paying attention to everything that goes on. Just because they're not publicly saying it or publicly doing something, the regulators will build their case, build their case, build their case. And when they want to make a point, they're going to make a point and they'll make it hard and fast. Certainly in Canada, and I know that for a fact in the United States and the U.S. Uh, regulatory uh, environment is very much a global standard. So uh, I would say that regulators need to come to the table with an attitude of learn, 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 understand change. You know, from our perspective, as a centralized finance uh, anticipated to be fully regulated, we are we are learning about you know everything in your digital world, everything in block has an impact for our workflow, for our processes, for all of that. So, you know, uh, regulation will change. It will change dramatically. Um, but those of us who are in the industry, whether you are, you know, decentralized or whatever implication or whatever area you want to put yourself, you still need to understand the regulations, pay attention to them, be part of the conversation, come to the table with something to say, because your opinion is valid, because you're building exchanges, you're selling product, you have investors at the end of any exchange, there are investors there. So uh, be part of the conversation and move the regulatory environment to one that is conducive and make for a better industry, because a better industry is good for all of us. Thank you. There's some interesting um, themes coming out of this. Uh, you know, I don't think anybody is uh, saying that the radical innovation and experimentation is necessarily a bad thing, apart from the obvious scams and all the rest out there, that regulation absolutely has its place, um, and that regulators are always slower than the technology itself, and that uh, new rules are coming, and hopefully there's good open dialogue and global frameworks. Now, in saying that, I know, Barif, you've gone out of your way to um, ensure that the ethics are there in what you're doing. Can you tell us a little bit about how you're set up from a legal perspective and uh, what concerns or advantages, perhaps, you might have um, uh, to leverage exchange? Right. So I'm going to agree with uh, my co-panelists on some of the things, but I'm going to disagree on a few key important uh, points. The first is that the regulator's concern is not really fraud. It is widespread fraud. Um, in the 800 or so cases that SEC prosecutes, less than 50 are regarding fraud. The rest of them are just, uh, you know, the right paperwork was not filed or, you know, this sort of thing. Now, in a country that has, you know, almost like a billion trades, a billion financial transactions a year, are you going to say that there's only been 50 frauds, right? So the regulators are making, you know, they've made it very clear that um, they're interested in what's called market integrity. And market integrity, uh, one of the aspects of that is widespread fraud, but the more important uh, aspect, the, the thing that makes regulation needed is custody. When you have, uh, when you take the assets of thousands and thousands of people and give it into the hands of 
a small group of people, there is something called moral hazard and that this moral hazard needs to be regulated. So this is this is what almost all the regulations are about. Like, uh, don't commingle things. Uh, your funds, you know, keep separate accounts. Um, you know, the uh, various um, information asymmetries, and so on. So th this is what this is what the crux of the regulation is about. And the reason DeFi is working and thriving is because it avoids the problem of custody. The people who build the systems do not have custody of the funds. And I think that this also has given rise to this great spurt of innovation. Every two or three months, there's a completely conceptually different product. I mean, AMMs were unknown like six months ago. Uh, I mean, they were known, but not, you know, they didn't have this traction. And you know, before that, uh, that you know, there were all this. Other, if you look at the history, everything from the creation of cryptocurrency to creation of smart contracts to creation of US 20s to now NFTs and everything. So you you are see you are in a space where every three to six months there's something completely different. It is going to be very very hard to think of even think of regulating this new thing because in three months the old model is gone and there's something totally new. So um, so what is the what is the you know what is the approach that we as the, the DeFi industry should take? And the regulators should take on their sides. Uh, what we we uh, should do is is very simple. We should make sure there's absolutely no custody because if you don't have custody, most of the uh, laws are not applicable to you. I shouldn't say most of the laws are not applicable to you. That's inaccurate. Uh, it's just a lot easier to comply with. You still have to comply. You still have to uh, get legal clearance and all of that. Uh, it just eases a lot of the burden both enforcement and compliance uh, what regulators need to do i think is they should uh, have some sort of uh, uh, you know fast track as you know uh, we just heard a few minutes ago if your application takes a calendar year or two just to uh, just for the files to move the problem is that your tech space is going to get obsolete the thing that you are spending all this money and time on is already um, uh, is already the market is already uh, you know moved past that. It's just, it's, you know, market is doing something else. So I, I think there needs to be some sort of uh, um, uh, some sort of uh, license or some sort of uh, uh, generic approach that allows you to do um, uh, allows uh, entrepreneurs to create products uh, without defining um, you know exactly what is what what is being done. I, this is the only way. Regulators can even think about regulating. Uh, otherwise, you know, um, the, the, by the time they study, by the time they um, collect data, by, you know, by the time they figure out who is doing what, uh, let alone figure out who needs to prosecute. Just by the time they figure out what's going on, the the, the market would have moved. Um, so, so hopefully, um, we we can you know solve that soon. I'm gonna throw a couple of. Uh... I guess statistics into the mix here. So, um, you know, world assets globally, global trading volumes, whether forex uh, or commodities, they're measured in trillions, right? Crypto and the DeFi specifically, we're talking about you know ten to twenty billion worth of addressable market. So, if you have a financial product, how many people could you sell it to? It, regulation is really about distribution, isn't it? So. James, when you get your license, you know, Canada is a fantastic jurisdiction. That type of investor, the institutional investors, the broker dealers, the retailers that use those broker dealers, you know, they have access to this asset class because you are regulated and because Canada is actually an interesting jurisdiction that attracts global trading, right? So you get mass distribution. I view and support what you're doing because you help broaden distribution and inflow of capital into this exciting new asset class. Whereas for a decentralized exchange, um, you're not regulated, not to that extent, and your distribution is immediate and global. Anyone can interact with a smart contract on chain, essentially. So instead of throwing this back onto the fence, onto the two of you, how about I move it to Jonathan? What are your thoughts in terms of <laughs> uh, this is regulation um, equal distribution uh, and you know, do you support both 
uh, immediate um, ability for anybody that's got coins to participate versus you know uh, centralized exchanges that are super clean, provably clean, and broadening global distribution. Ah, I'm, I'm going to take a bite at this. Um, so there's a little uh, coin called Cardano that's, uh, you know, changing the way some of uh, this stuff works, right, with uh, proof of stake. And proof of stake is exceptionally complicated uh, from a regulatory point of view, right? And so if I'm a pool operator and I have someone stake in my pool, how do I know who that person is? You don't. Mm -hmm. And so in theory, dear regulator, I hope you're not listening, but this is the kind of stuff that we deal with, right? Is what happens if there's somebody who's on an OFAC list that stakes within your pool? What mm -hmm. happens when Iran <laughs> uh, jumps in uh, or North Korea jumps in or Venezuela, who's currently uh, at odds with our government, jumps in, right? And we don't know, we have no idea and that's one of the problems we have currently, right now, in this real world. And so is it a matter of more regulation? Well, how the hell do you regulate that? How, how do you turn off, I think, number 10, maybe, on coin market cap? And the answer is you don't. You can't. Because Ethereum is about to switch over to arguably the same mechanism. And so when that happens, good luck, regulators. Like, you've got to learn this stuff. Like James was saying, sit down. Like this is not this is not going away. This is going to require taking a lot of time and effort because, you know, Fran, as you mentioned, like there's trillions of dollars on the line. This is not something that's, uh, you know, what did they call them, Chuck E. Cheese tokens and all the other uh, mm -hmm. bullshit names uh, back in the 2000s or the uh, the teens when you know Bitcoin first came out. Like, oh, this is just fake digital money. Uh, in reality, this is a, a, a world-changing asset class, regardless of whether it's commodities, utilities, or securities, let alone the digital stable coins of, you know, uh, a, an actual backed currency like uh, Bermuda Sand Dollar. So when it comes to figuring out what the answer is, is it goes back to it depends. It really depends on the blockchain, it depends <laughs> on proof of work, the proof of stake. Uh, but I do encourage regulators to you know, find the projects that actually are doing the good work and work with us. Or if we come to you, come and and I have to give it to the SEC and, and for most part the CFTC, no offense. Uh, you guys have been really great in a lot of ways, but in a lot of ways you've, you've also, uh, you, you don't have it yet. And, and I don't know if that's a, a, I don't know if that's an administrative issue <laughs> that will hopefully be resolved. Or it, is it a, uh, a just a, a lack of, of uh, the ability to, to grasp uh, the change of the tide? And, and we're going to find out. Uh, and we're going to find out pretty quickly uh, which one it is. And I hope we're on the right side because in theory, uh, as much as I do love my country, we could lose our crown as the financial center of the world. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Well, look, I, I do believe that technology can in fact, solve some of these issues. I've been advocating for a wallet meets decentralized self-sovereign identity solution for a couple of years now, so that you could anonymously interact with zero proofs, and that you, as a regulated exchange, let's say TFOS, will explicitly know that person is not on a terrorist list or some kind of sanction list, mm -hmm. right? Because Kim Jong-un could accumulate, I don't know, um, security tokens that programmatically pay dividends and nobody knows that you know nefarious actors have accumulated these alternative assets how do you solve that uh, unfortunately i don't think all of the middleware and infrastructure is quite there to have that but that's my personal prediction is i think technology will ultimately streamline so that you can have private but absolutely compliance transactions and that's probably another five years away but i'd like to move on to the next question which is um, hopefully a juicy one. Who's being disrupted? Right? Is it asset managers, wealth management? Is it regulators? Is it? Um, I've got to jump know, on which is the first? Bit, guys. I, I, this is a pet peeve of mine. I'm so glad we, we did this. I forgot this was a question. Um, financial advisors. I'm, I'm talking to you right now. Uh, <laughs> if you don't know what Bitcoin is, you should be fired. Um, if you don't know what Ethereum is, quit. Um, 
because these are the asset classes, whether you deal with high net worth individuals or the average mom and pop who wants to retire in the next five, 10, 20 years, you should have an idea of what these are just for your own education and let alone your client's financial status. And that's really frustrating the absolute hell out of me because you always message me on LinkedIn asking about, you know, do I need services? And when I ask you about Bitcoin, you don't even know what that is. You've heard of it, but you don't own any of it. And that troubles me. How can you be a financial advisor and not own Bitcoin? So I'll, so I'll I'll take it. Think of that, but that was my little personal message to every single one of you financial advisors who've messaged me over the past four <laughs> years and had the same spiel. So financial advisors is the first to be disrupted or should be in your opinion. Should Barif, be. Um, feel free to talk about any part of this vertical. Who do you think is ultimately disrupted now and perhaps in five years time? Because it'll be ultimately be different um, yeah, between now and then. Right. So I think that the, that the entire financial industry is going to get disrupted, including banks, investment banks, um, really everybody, every single thing, uh, exchanges. Uh, and this is because everything is essentially reimagined. Um, and we are seeing things that are just not possible and have a significant value add when done in a decentralized manner. So, um, and Bitcoin is a classic example, right? So it has disrupted the, your uh, sovereign currency itself, right? So you can essentially pay anyone uh, across the world, you know, any part of the world without an intermediary. This, this itself was just an amazing thing. When, uh, when I got my, one of my friends to first try Bitcoin, he said, this is it, this is it, banks are gone. And the, he, he was not even a techno, technology person, he's not even a financial person. So when, when you see this kind of realization and when you see uh, the only reason people had, this has not happened faster is because the UX is still lacking. The US is, you know, people are still afraid of losing their keys and, and, and so on. Uh, once that problem is solved, I think you will really see the cascade. So you, you think Bitcoin at 16,000 is, is uh, accomplishment. I mean, this is going to just skyrocket. But in the short term, the, the ones who are getting disrupted by DeFi are other DeFi projects. So the iteration is so fast between projects. The competition is so you know fierce. And the people working on these projects are so brilliant. And of course, they are they're, they're, uh, reckless uh, in the sense, you know, they'll just copy somebody's code, make a little modification, test it straight in production, people losing money. Um, and despite these, these um, severe uh, risks, people are still throwing money. I, I see, you know, uh, a smart contract put out there by nobody, some, some anonymous person and people and, and within a few hours it has you know 10 20 million in it and i'm wondering wow these guys are brave the, the people throwing money in it are really brave because they really want this to happen they want this reality uh, to unfold as soon as possible they are not cautious they have they completely believe that the status quo is something seriously seriously wrong and this is the vision of the future so um, uh, I'm you just know, gonna this is the beginning. That, yeah. I'm just going to say that my personal pet peeve is people that test in production. That should be a criminal offense. I think what's going on here is that the world kind of needs at the very least some kind of social contract that if you're going to manufacture a financial instrument, you better damn well understand that's not going to immediately lose in, you know, thousands of people's entire value, just vaporizing, right? But I think that's going to be cleaned out and self-regulated and then eventually regulated as well. It's because people are getting sick of rug pulls and scams and, and all the rest and being a lot more cautious. My favorite new term, the other part that you mentioned, was about what's uh, um, being re referred to as uh, liquidity vampirism. Right, Lovely term where you can put out a project, it gets a billion dollars AUM like Uniswap, you just fork the code and you know, siphon off. 
uh, adds add some additional incentives for that liquidity to come over. It may or may not work. So there's a defensibility consideration that's quite interesting as well. So moving on, same question for you, James. What is being disrupted? You know, uh, from your perspective as a, a heavily regulated business, um, and perhaps from a personal perspective, what would you like to see disrupted? Well, when I look at the disruption that has occurred and, and subsequent to 2008 and et cetera, it is driven off of those who have vision, those who have strong technology backgrounds. But as it moves into the mainstream, you know, for example, um, Greenwich Economic Forum, which is just ongoing as we speak, for the first time has digital assets on their agenda. So as it moves to the mainstream, the reality is that you're going to see the activity and all of the very much volatile activity that uh, Baroff uh, referred to move to the fray and it will fall under the um, awareness, come to the awareness of regulators. They will pay attention. Bonafide going to happen. And when you say product uh, circulates circulation will be so quick that they won't keep up, they'll find a way, it will happen. Because the end of the day, all of that activity, as you yourself said, has to lead to market integrity. And at the bottom of a lack of market activity is fraud. So the, the real disruption will continue to come where it's coming from, but it is now moving into the mainstream. So when you talk about Wall Street, Bay Street, whatever street, uh, the it's, it's moving into mainstream. And that will um, uh, have a different look to it uh, because all of the you know issues of custody, all of those uh, issues of at the end of the day, when you have a buyer and seller, there has to be a level of uh, reality to that trade. There has to be a bona fide trade. It can't be anything other than you know supply and demand meeting in its bo its most base manner. And to think otherwise is to not have an awareness of where market integrity should be. So I think the um, the disruption will continue to be driven out of groups that are incredibly technologically astute, uh, but as it moves to the mainstream, it's going to become a, a, a much different uh, looking activity. Well, this is far too interesting not to uh, allow Gareth to perhaps chime in if there's anything you'd like to add to that. Right. So um, I think that the major players, you know, the, the major participants have been in this whole space ever since it started, have been people who are very comfortable with this, right? And people who have vision and they have seen, uh, they are able to look into the future. So just like I mentioned, when I saw Bitcoin, I knew this was a once in a generation opportunity. I'm sure this is just not me. This is most people who've been in the space long enough were able to see it. Um, when it comes to uh, you know regulation and all of this, when what what we do is we have the ability to create validity proofs, so that whenever there is a transaction, everyone who observes it, this is both the traders, the regulators, the, the ordinary public, because this is goes on the blockchain, they can validate that this trade is um, is compliant with every rule and in fact com um, compliance sorry, gotta, as part of yeah sorry i'm just uh, getting prompted for a timing up um just want to get each of you 30 seconds what is the futurist prediction what is the space going to look like in 30 seconds or less uh, each of you by this time next year Barif? I think by next year, the trading volume will double. Bitcoin's price is probably going to double. Uh, and you're going to see a lot of layer two exchanges trading. And you'll see a lot of new retail flow, new, uh, a new ordinary retail, not institutions, but you, you're going to see a lot of ordinary people coming into the space. Thank you, James. Same question 12 months from now. Fran, 12 months from now, you'll see TIFOs uh, at the epicenter of a lot of the activity supporting the digital asset community and other assets. Um, I think you're going to see an answer to the question between, you know, centralized and decentralized. The answer is going to be in the middle. Um, uh, that's what Jonathan stated earlier. The answer will be in the middle. What happens in decentralized will pick up some of the characteristics of centralized 
and vice versa. That's where the evolution will go and the activity will move. And uh, it will be a far more robust. It will be a far larger uh, market. And and again, I think there will be a bit of a, uh, a centralization of liquidity and order flow because at the end of the day, that is what we're here as an exchange is to bring order flow together, to bring participants together in an orderly manner. Thank you. I agree with everyone. Uh, I'm hoping to see more worldwide collaboration. I'd like to see the United States and other countries, especially Canada, start working uh, well together when it comes to the regulatory aspect of this that hasn't really occurred yet. And I think that cross-border solutions uh, with our countries is especially necessary uh, for the greater good of this entire industry. Um, so I'm hoping that that's the biggest thing that we kind of can put together because once we get it done over here, we can start spreading it to Europe and even Fran down in New Zealand. So I'm hoping that uh, also a year from now, Tracy will invite us all back and we can do a panel uh, in person, hopefully COVID free and a vaccine and all of that good stuff and uh, see who was right. Amen. Yeah, I'd love to come back a year from now. Personally, my prediction is that uh, Bitcoin will be sitting about 250k USD a piece. Uh, the chaos around the world will continue. Um, you know, this is a battle between using blockchain to make things more efficient and transparent, uh, replicating real world stuff using blockchain versus uh, essentially totally unstoppable financial automata, as I like to call them. So the answer, I believe, is somewhere in the middle. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you, everyone. The time is up. Thank you. And, uh, Thank you, guys.